Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Patterson. I'm one of the co-founders of the Boston Global Forum uh, and at the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Tuan Nguyen, who is Boston Global Forum CEO, Editor-in-Chief. Uh, like everything, he put this conference together. So uh, he is in the minds of those in Boston Global Forum, the Boston Global Forum. Uh, and uh, this is part of our continuing effort to draw attention to cybersecurity. Uh, in an earlier conference, we announced the Code of Conduct for Cyber Peace and Security. Earlier, we also announced the establishment of Cyber Security Day, uh, which is the day we observe today. And we hope that other organizations will take our lead uh, and help us to grow it. And later this morning, uh, Anders Core of Core Analytics will summarize our recently prepared uh, cybersecurity report. Uh, before introducing you to uh, Michael Dukakis, uh, who will moderate today's conference, uh, I want to read to you a message uh, we received yesterday from Ban Ki-moon, the UN General Secretary. It is a pleasure to greet the Boston Global Forum. Thank you, Governor Dukakis for convening this gathering and for guiding its initiatives. I welcome your focus on cybersecurity. Advances in technology and science have opened up wonderful new opportunities, but they have also exposed us to new risks. As our lives have moved increasingly online, so too must our values and principles. Cybersecurity has become a major global challenge with wide-ranging implications for peace, security, trade and sustainable development. The United Nations has recognized the need to confront the threats that arise from the use of ICTs and the internet for purposes that are inconsistent with the objectives of the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Member states have been working to develop a global culture of cybersecurity that can fight cyber terrorism and cyber crime while protecting freedom and sharing the benefits of ICTs and the internet. Cybersecurity will also be crucial as we implement the recently adopted 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which will require us to tap into the potential of the data revolution and cl close today's still large digital divides. On 15-16 December, the United Nations General Assembly will convene a high-level meeting to review progress in the implementation of the outcome of the World Summit on the Information Society. Your discussion at this year's Global Forum can provide a timely contribution as we strive together to meet these challenges. Thank you for your support, and please accept my best wishes for a productive forum. Now I'd like to introduce you to Michael Dukakis, who's the co-founder uh, and chair of Boston Global Forum, uh, three-term governor of Massachusetts, 1988 presidential, Democratic presidential nominee. Uh, Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Northeastern. I could go on now. Uh, Mike. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Um, good to have so many of you here with us in Cambridge, and I hope hundreds of you all over the globe who are going to be participating in this conference. And uh, it's a special pleasure, thanks to the Internet, to be able to connect with so many people around the globe. And as all of you know, the Boston Global Forum has been uh, focused on this particular issue now for the past several months. We expect to do so at least for the next year. So uh, we invite the participation and involvement of lots and lots of people and are especially pleased to have that statement from the Secretary General. Cybersecurity is obviously a leading issue of our time. We've just had some major, major developments in Paris and San Bernardino, San Bernardino which remind us of that. And we also ought to bear in mind, it seems to me, that uh, nobody these days is blameless. Uh, the United States and Israel were involved in that Stuxnet caper, which uh, we're all familiar with. Uh, my country, I'm sorry to say, hacked the Chancellor of Germany and the President of Mexico. And I'm sure other countries are doing exactly the same thing all over the world. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think the uh, Secretary General's statement and the work that the UN is doing is so important. The Internet, as we all know, is a source of great benefits. 
but it's also a source of mayhem and mischief. Cyber-based threats ranging from online fraud to the stealing of state and business secrets are on the rise. And for that reason, we need to make cybersecurity an imperative as individuals, as organizations, as governments, as the international community. And to this end, the Boston Global Forum has developed the Ethics Code of Conduct for Cyber Peace and Security. It tries to prescribe how netizens, IT experts, institutions, governments, and others should act. And in an effort to advance the cause of cybersecurity, the Boston Global Forum has initiated Global Cybersecurity Day, and this conference marks that day. We hope others will adopt that idea, building on it in the way that nearly 50 years ago, millions of people came out of their homes and communities to celebrate Earth Day, as it was originally conceived and promoted. In our conference today, we have a number of activities aimed at highlighting cybersecurity. We have initiated an online festival open to people around the world, an opportunity for them to share the benefits of the internet. And we will honor today leaders in cybersecurity, as well as leaders who have contributed to peace, security, and development around the world. Now, I'm going to be taking my cues from Tuan Nguyen, who, as Tom so rightly pointed out, is the man who conceived all of this. And um, Tuan, I think I'm now supposed to introduce Tom, Tom back again. Uh, Robert, so, uh, Robert, are you coming? Yeah, Tom, Tom Robert. Patterson or Tom Fiedler? Uh, I think that's when I think me. Tom Fiedler. <laughs> um, this young man who's approaching the uh, podium is a guy I've known for a long time. Born on Cape Cod right. in Falmouth, Massachusetts. And one of the best reporters and political editors in the country who, for better or for worse, covered me, among other people, in the 1988 <laughs> presidential campaign. And now a dean at uh, Boston University. He's back home. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, welcome. Thank you, Governor. Welcome. Thanks very much. So you. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I bring you greetings from across the river, from Boston University. Uh, it's, um, I believe, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing, among many honorees that will be noted today, the, uh, the award for business leader in cybersecurity. So let me read the, the language. On behalf of the Boston Global Forum, we would like to recognize two outstanding individuals who have dedicated their careers to the betterment of technology, security, privacy, and the internet within the cybersecurity community at large. Both Mr. Bruce Schneier and Mikko Hyponen have clearly demonstrated their knowledge, skills, and abilities in cybersecurity, both in practice and in educating others. These gentlemen also share many of the same values instilled within the Boston Global Forum and the Ethics Code of Conduct for Peace and Security. They are recognized here today as leaders in cybersecurity and ambassadors for peace, security, and the greater good of the internet and its future. Congratulations to them both. Uh, and let me read this. Uh, is um, is uh, Bruce here? No. He will. Ah, okay. Oh, excellent, excellent. Here is, well, let me read the award. It says, uh, for business leaders in cybersecurity, the Boston Global Forum is honored to present this award to, to Bruce Schneier for his great contribution to educating the public about cybersecurity. And many of you know him here as a uh, fellow at the Berkman Center and from his many prolific books and blogs. And, uh, and welcome. Um, thank you. I assume, Ernie, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased about the forum and business and how they come together. And I think the important thing we have to think about is the speed of innovation. You know, the internet gives us is an enormous speed of innovation. And I think that's the reason why we put so much of our, our future in corporate hands. And if you look at government innovation versus commercial innovation, commercial innovation is faster. It's going to do things better, quicker, it's going to innovate, it's going to iterate. And you know, it's for a couple of reasons. You know, we live in a society that, that is based on rights and not permissions. That you can do something, if you think of it, 
and not have to wait for permission. And that really lets us innovate much faster. Now, the thing is security is that the attackers are innovating too, just as fast. And by attackers, I mean something very general. Hackers, criminals, corporations, governments, our own others. And we're seeing all through our technical society, attacks innovate faster than defenses. I mean, some of it's easy. I mean, some of it's easy to understand. There's a, there's a basic first mover advantage for an attacker. Some of it is because they are quicker to make use of innovations. Like they don't have a procurement process. They don't have any rules they have to follow. And because of this, there's, there's a delay. And you can see it again and again, a delay between when the two attack appears and when defenses appear. You can see that in things like credit card fraud. You can see it in identity theft. You can see it in how organizations are using the internet to organize for criminal activity. And again and again, we are, we are playing catch up. And that means we have a security gap. We have a gap between when attackers invent something new and when defenders figure out how to defend against it. And as technology moves faster, we're going to see a wider gap, a bigger gap, that can be taken advantage of. Right? Uh, the Zukakis mentioned Stuxnet. That was a cyber weapon created by the US and Israel fired against Iran because attack is easier than defense. And similarly, we have seen China fire cyber weapons at the United States, the OPM data breach. We've seen companies come up with business models that basically surveil us and provide a product or service or make a profit based on that. And again and again, we are seeing the offensive uses of data outstrip the defenses. And that means that we, as defenders of society, need to start thinking ahead, thinking more holistically, thinking more with more agility, really with more resilience. Now, I have a company up at Alewife, three subway stops uh, north of the red line, called Resilient Systems. And we are right now building incident response coordination capabilities. The idea being that when you're being attacked, you need to be fast and effective in response. That's a microcosm. We need to do that at every level. We need to do that at the policy level, internationally, and, and personally. We need to get better at security, not just in reaction to what the attackers do, but to think ahead in what could happen and to be able to quickly adapt to what does happen. So when you think about cybersecurity and the future and codes of conduct, don't think about today. Think about the future. Today's top secret NSA programs are tomorrow's PhD theses and the next day's hacker tools. And that will happen again and again and again. And data and technology and computers and networks are becoming so fundamental that we will not be able to make society work unless we can get ahead of this. Thank you. Thank you very much for the award. And I wish I was there, but I'm not. And thank you for letting me attend remotely. Thank you. Our next uh, award will go to the practitioner in cybersecurity for 2015, and Bob, come on up here. Professor Robert Desimond from MIT, who's professor and director of the McGovern Institute, uh, founded and financed, I might say, by an old friend of mine who is no longer with us. Anyway, great to have you. Good to see you. So greetings from the McGovern Institute at MIT. It is my honor to present this year's Practitioner in Cybersecurity Award to Michael Hipponen. Is he online now? No. 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 So. Oh, for his, for, his great public, for his great work and active contribution to the public's knowledge of cybersecurity. 
I think. Now, we have three awards we want to uh, give to world leaders. And uh, let me address each of them first. Uh, the first is to the Prime Minister of Japan, who's been a leader internationally in the effort to do something about cybersecurity. Ironically, his political office was hacked two days ago in Tokyo. So this is not a, uh, an imaginary problem for world leaders. Um, and this award is given to individuals who contribute significantly to the advancement of cybersecurity. Prime Minister Abe has worked tirelessly to make cybersecurity a priority in Japan. Japan's private sector, particularly, has been lagging in its cybersecurity efforts and recognizing that problem and looking ahead to next year's G7 summit, which will be held in Japan, and then, of course, the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Prime Minister Abe has made cybersecurity a top policy priority. Under his leadership, Japan recently held a Cyber 3 conference in partnership with the World Economic Forum. The Prime Minister has initiated and led the activity of a newly created cabinet-level office to oversee national policy and promote international cooperation in accordance with the Cybersecurity Basic Act enacted a year ago. And this year, he announced Japan's cybersecurity strategy, a far-reaching plan to strengthen public-private efforts in the cybersecurity area. In that strategy, Japan announced an ambitious diplomatic initiative focusing on international rules and intergovernmental capacity building. He has also exerted regional leadership in this area, engaging in capacity building through the cooperation between Japan and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. These and other efforts have put Prime Minister Abe in the forefront among world leaders in advancing the cause of cybersecurity, and the Boston Global Forum is honored to present him the World Leader in Cybersecurity Award. So, little picture, <laughs> photo opportunity. ご来場の皆様、こんにちは。内閣総理大臣の安倍晋三です。ボストングローバルフォーラムが本年設立三周年を迎えられ。本日、このカンフェランスが盛大に開催されましたことに、心からお喜びを申し上げます。この度は、ワールドリーダー・イン・サイバーセキュリティ・アウォードをいただき、ありがとうございます。大変光栄に感じております。今や、あらゆるものがインターネットに接続され、情報通信技術がもの、サービスに結びつき、浸透ししてていいく時代が到来していますサイバー空間における安全の確保サイバーセキュリティは IT の利活用を進め成長戦略を実践するために必要不可欠な基盤です。と同時に国家の安全保障危機管理にとっても極めて重大な課題です。我が国は2016年に伊勢志摩サミット2020年には東京オリンピック・パラリンピックを控えております。これらを確実に成功に導くためにもサイバーセキュリティに万全を期す必要があります。このため政府としては昨年11月にサイバーセキュリティ基本法を制定し今年9月に新たなサイバーセキュリティ戦略を閣議で決定するなど国としてサイバーセキュリティの強化に全力を挙げて取り組んでいるところですサイバー攻撃は年々増加し国家の関与が疑われるような組織的で高度な攻撃手法なども登場しており今後国際社会への脅威がさらに深刻化することが予想されます我が国は今後とも米国をはじめとする国際社会のパートナーと緊密に連携し、国の重要な情報や財産をしっかりと守り、国際社会の平和と安定の実践のために主導的な役割を果たしてまいります。ボストン
グローバルフォーラムの皆様におかれては世界各国でサイバーセキュリティに関する啓発活動を推進し理論を盛り上げていただいており大変心強く思います。本日サイバーセキュリティデイに行われる世界を代表する皆様方の議論を契機として安全なサイバー空間の構築に向けた取り組みが一層進展することを心より記念しご挨拶といたします。And representing Japanese government here at our meeting and conference today is a good friend, the Consul General of Japan here in Boston. Tommy, come up and say a few words. My governor, Michael, thank you very much. And uh, Boston Global Forum, thank you very much for this. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, governor, uh, Michael, and uh, Boston Global Forum, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Prime Minister of Japan and the Japanese government, it is a great privilege for me to be physically here. And I will make certain that this award will be physically be、uh, presented to、uh, Prime Minister. I'm sure、uh, with all of your Uh, help. Uh, soon、uh, we will be able to deliver this through the cyberspace,、uh, but in the meantime, I have to uh, uh, use a more traditional、uh, means. But I just like to uh, say uh, how pleased we are because we are trying to make、uh, as much progress as possible, and this is a very good encouragement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next award. Goes to our this year's world leader in peace, security, and development, and that is Chancellor Angela Merkel. The award is given to individuals who display exemplary leadership in promoting peace, security, and development. And the Chancellor has worked tirelessly toward these goals, not only in Germany but in the EU and adjoining regions. She's now in her tenth year as Chancellor. And she has a legacy that few post-war European leaders can match. She has led Germany through its economic recovery, while also holding together the eurozone as it faced the danger of default by a member nation. That's fairly close to me, I might add.、Uh, she has led the European response to the crisis in Ukraine, promoting tough sanctions while speaking out against those that would escalate the military conflict. Most recently, she has led the European response to the refugee crisis with extraordinary political courage. I might say, and has done so by example, opening Germany's borders and doors to nearly a million asylum seekers. That's not only difficult to do as a matter of execution; it's a very difficult thing to do politically. And for that alone, she deserves enormous praise. In words addressed to the German people, but intended for all of Europe, she said, "In many regions, war and terror prevail; states disintegrate." For many years, we have read about this. We have heard about it. We have seen it on TV, but we have not yet sufficiently understood that what happens in Aleppo and Mosul, Mosul, can affect Essen or Stuttgart. We have to face that now. Such efforts have put Chancellor Merkel in the forefront among world leaders in advancing the cause of peace, security, and development, which is obviously what the Boston Global Forum is striving to do. And so we are honored to present her with this award. Thank you. And the plaque reads: "For her exemplary leadership and contribution to peace, security, and development in Germany, the EU, and adjoining areas." And I might add, and I might add, throughout the world. Congratulations, Chancellor Merkel. On a Monday. Finally, I'm pleased to announce our other recipient of this year's World Leader in Peace, Security, and Development Award, Nguyen Thanh Dung, the Prime Minister of Vietnam. The Prime Minister has been an exemplary leader not only for yet for Vietnam, but for the region. He built close ties to Myanmar's leaders and was instrumental in persuading them to adopt political reform. He has pressed ASEAN member states to increase their economic and cultural ties. He has been a powerful voice for the rule of law and mutual respect as the standards for resolving disputes in the South China Sea. 
He is one of Asia's strongest proponents of cyber openness and security. In Vietnam, he has led Vietnam's economic recovery effort, <clears throat> putting his country on the path to sustainable and rapid economic growth. <clears throat> he has forged major trade agreements with countries in Asia, Europe, and North and South America. He has spearheaded Vietnam's efforts at political and government reform, prompting World Business Magazine to name him one of Asia's top reform leaders. Prime Minister Dung is a transformational leader who has brought positive change to Vietnam and to Asia. And so the Boston Global Forum is honored to present him with this award, and in doing so, to acknowledge his contribution and that of the Vietnamese people to advancing the cause of peace, security, and development. And the plaque reads to Prime Minister Nguyen Thanh Dung for his exemplary leadership and contribution to peace, security, and development in Vietnam and Asia. Congratulations, Mr. Prime Minister. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to begin, turn to, to uh, our discussion of this issue, and we're going to start with Jeremy. Samit, Jerry, Jeremy, where are you? Come on up here and lead us in this next part of the program. Thanks, my friend. Good morning. So again, my name is Jeremy Samidi. I am a Governor Michael Dukakis Fellow at the Boston Global Forum. So what I'm going to do briefly today is um, talk a little bit about the cyber threat landscape. Um, again, provide some statistics uh, that we have seen uh, out in the field. Um, and then kind of go into a little bit about the action plan as a part of being a fellow at the Boston Global Forum of what I've been tasked to do as part of that. Okay, so I want to just go through a couple of uh, quick slides here um, and, and kind of go through the, the reality of what we're seeing in cybersecurity. We all know that it's, it's a grim picture out there. Um, so what you're seeing here is a breakdown of where the cyber threats and where the cyber attacks are coming from. So what you see here is approximately 70% of cyber attacks are related to cyber crime, which are financially motivated, which means, simply put, is that close to 70% of cyber attacks are, are targeted at stealing your data for profit. The next slide I want to show here again is this is the uh, distribution of targets. Uh, so what you see here in the top six um, at the top here, relating to industry, uh, social networking, online forums, single individuals, dating sites, and other organizations as well as governments. This affects everybody in the room. Um, a couple of people have spoken about it this morning as far as the, the uh, cyber attack on Japan. So everybody in this room is affected by cybersecurity in some form or another. These are the attack techniques that we're seeing. So the one I want to point out here is, is the largest chunk in, in red, the pinkish red there on the left, which is unknown. So approximately 26% of cyber attacks are unknown today, which means we have no idea what they are. We have no idea where they come from and, or what they do and how they attack. That is a very large number that we are seeing today as far as cyber attacks. Okay. This is a recent article here. Um, talks about the cyber losses today. Um, they're estimated anywhere between 300 billion and a trillion. It's probably between 300 and 500 billion dollars globally in productivity loss as a result of cyber attacks. That's productivity, identity theft, intellectual property theft, trade secrets, etc. Over. Um, okay, so back one more, please. So in the Q Q3 of 2015, there were approximately 350 thousand new pieces of malware just in the mobile sector. Those are very staggering statistics. Okay. Um, this is a very pedestrian look uh, here at um, what's known as the dark web or the dark net, also referred to as the deep web. 
Um, the dark web gets a lot of negative connotation to it. But as you can see here, um, sites that we visit, like Amazon and Google uh, and eBay and sites that we all are very familiar with, only represents approximately 19% of the internet, the searchable internet today. Approximately 80% of the internet is unindexed, unsearchable, where all of the illicit activities occur down in what's called the dark web. So you have your hackers down there, they're trading malware, they're selling illegal drugs, they're doing all kinds of illicit activities. Uh, governments are down there as well. Um, this is the negative side of what you hear about the dark web. It provides anonymity and people do a lot of very illicit things. Um, but there are some good things about the dark web and I know uh, my colleague uh, Bill Ottman will talk about that today as well. Um, it provides a lot of free speech for countries that don't have free speech, that want to um, talk about things that uh, are going on in their countries. So um, th again, this is a very pedestrian look at, at, at what the dark web is. So what I've been charged with doing as part of the Boston Global Forum is building the Cyber Threat Index. So what we have done is we have started to put this together. These are some screenshots of the site that we are still developing. And what we're doing and what we have seen in working with academia and researchers around the world is that there's a disconnect between the technical reality of what's going on and, and, and how that we can connect that with policymakers, legislators around the world to, to develop better policies. So what we're doing is we're attempting to um, collect um, all of the cyber attacks around the globe. And that's a very daunting task. So we started sampling that with a, with a number of different sources in collecting that information. So what we're doing is we're collecting all that information. We're going to allow our subscribers to take a look at all of the cyber attacks that have happened. And we're, we're going to put a, uh, an index together that um, uh, sort of puts these on a scale um, from a severity level to show um, how severe these attacks are, the global impact, the efficacy of them, um, go ahead, uh, the vulnerabilities that are out there as well so that we can provide these this type of data in, in a one-stop shop area to provide reports and other types of data for policymakers and legislators to look at and show them where these attacks are coming from, how they're attacking us, and what we need to do to better formalize our, our policies and regulations. Um, so this is something that we're building now and we're going to continue to build. So as this thing rolls out, we'll keep everybody up to date on where we are. Um, and that's it. That's part of my action plan. Thank you. Anders Kaur has joined us uh, on a number of our meetings and done an extensive report on cybersecurity, which is on our website and available to the public generally. He's here with us. Uh, I'd like to introduce him and then following his presentation, um, have a good discussion of the participants here um, as we discuss this issue. So Anders, come on up and do your thing. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. I was really happy to work with many of you on this report. It was really a collaborative effort of Boston Global Forum, although uh, nobody takes responsibility for some of the views that I'll uh, put out here but me, unless you speak up. Um, first of all, I, I'm very, very happy to be back here uh, at Harvard. I did my PhD here. I remember this room fondly as a graduate student uh, with Professor Martin Feldstein having his uh, uh, national uh, economics of national security seminars, which we uh, we did here, and this is all about economics. Cybersecurity is all about economics. It's all about cyber uh, national security. Um, that presentation, you see the. Bottom left, right there. Yeah. Should be on the bottom left corner. Okay. Um, oops. 
Let's see. Here we go. Yep. Perfect. Okay, slide. I'm going to cover uh, six major issues um, today. Really, what uh, what I'm doing is I I took what I consider the most controversial or most interesting points out of our paper, um, and I'm going to cover those in the talk. Uh, for other stuff in the paper, you can read the paper. Um, and as we heard from a previous speaker, uh, cybersecurity realm is an offense dominant realm. Uh, offense has the advantage uh, in in cybersecurity. Also going to cover encryption issues of encryption, um, moral hazard in cybersecurity insurance, um, cryptocurrencies, um, the interchangeability of white hat skills and black hat skills, or hacking skills and uh, what we would call sort of de cyber defense skills for professionals. Um, and then finally, uh, ethical issues that relate to cybersecurity and uh, the need to have a pure and clean, uh, a, a more of a pure, clean approach to ethics than we have right now in the cybersecurity realm. Um, I would argue that cybersecurity is uh, offense dominant in, uh, in terms of military technology or in terms, in terms of security technology in general. We heard that from a previous speaker. Uh, you have in, in, a, in an internet system or a, or a computer system, you have hundreds, millions, hun uh, billions of nodes that can be attacked by a black hat hacker. However, um, you have, so your defensive forces need to be spread all over all of those nodes in a network. And between each node, there's two edges. There's information going from node A to node B, and there's information going from node B to node A. Then you square that, or you, you cube it, if you include information that can go from node A to node A, and you get a remarkable diffusion of your defensive forces across your network, whereas the hacker, or black hat, can attack a single node and get into your network. So it's an offense dominant situation. Next slide. When dealing with the uh, offense dominant situation, you re offense is really the best defense. So we need to, rather than focus as we have on sort of a patchwork defensive approach, to cybersecurity, we need to completely shift gears. We can keep that going, but really the, the main impetus, I would argue, of, uh, of attack, the main avenue of attack on this issue, needs to be offensive operations against black hat hackers um, and illegitimate governments that are attacking our systems. That can include economic sanctions, as Angela Merkel had talked about. That can include heavy, uh, much stronger surveillance, including uh, back doors to encrypt the devices. Now what we see is uh, Google and Apple and all of the other big uh, device makers out there are building encryption into their systems without back doors as the norm. That means that every time you and I make a lunch date, which nobody cares about, that's encrypted. My phone's encrypted. So when I make a lunch date with Bill Ottman, that's an encrypted piece of information that nobody cares about. But that piece of information multiplied, multiplied by billions is the haystack in which the criminals, the terrorists, the illegitimate governments are hiding. We need legitimate governments to have back doors to that information in order to find, fix, and finish the criminals, terrorists, and illegitimate government use of the internet. Um, Right now, the cybersecurity insurance industry is of the order of $3 billion or something like that. It's pretty small. Whereas the losses annually are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. That means that very little of the cybersecurity risk is actually being covered. So individuals, companies are getting hit with these massive costs, especially when you consider the drops in market capitalization of companies after they're hit by a cyber attack which can reach in the billions of dollars. Um, when you consider that, the, the, the cost that our society is paying for cybersecurity is so massive uh, that we're going to see more and more of a demand for government subsidization of cybersecurity insurance. However, as with FEMA's subsidization of uh, disaster insur insurance such as hurricanes, as with uh, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, which, which subsidizes terrorism insurance, 
we see a real moral hazard develop where the uh, you know individuals and companies are incentivized to build their houses in places that are very insecure. We've got major corporations now in the most insecure cities in the world, New York City, DC, Paris, London, right? Our whole financial system is in London and, the, and New York, which are completely insecure to terrorist attacks. Yet government is subsidizing that, and government will subsidize cybersecurity um, insurance leading to the same kinds of risks being taken. So, uh, slide. Uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which is the biggest of them uh, by far, are on the rise. This, this graph is the value of, of Bitcoin over time. And it's hard to see it, but it goes, stretches back to, to, I forget what year, but quite a while ago. In 2011 or 12, you see a big spike. Each Bitcoin is worth $1,000 or more. Um, and now the value of Bitcoin is around $400. Now, what does Bitcoin use? What makes Bitcoin different than anything else? One, it's totally anonymous, which is great for terrorists and criminals. Two, uh, it's easy to transfer across uh, borders without any government regulation. So it's perfect for criminals and terrorists. And not only is it perfect for criminals and terrorists, but to, to make a Bitcoin actually requires quite a bit of computing power and computer engineers to mine the Bitcoin, to solve the mathematical problems required to, to get that Bitcoin. Now let's compare a Bitcoin and all the work that it takes to get one to $400. $400, you just print $400 bills. It's easy, the government does that. And who benefits when the government prints that money? If it's a, if it's a legitimate government, the, le the citizens of that legitimate government. Who benefits from the cryptocurrency that's made? No one really, because the person who mined that, that Bitcoin had to, pay quite, had to pay market rates for computers and computer engineers to get it out of the system. So there's no real benefit. It's a, it's, an, it's a loss to society. And it's used heavily by terrorists and criminals. I would argue we should make these cryptocurrencies illegal. Next slide. Um, the approach, the, the, the defensive approach to cybersecurity is let's increase our cybersecurity budget so that we can hire more cybersecurity specialists. Well, the, the skills that you need to be a good cybersecurity specialist are exactly the same skills you need to be a hacker. So if we increase our hacking skills out there as a defensive measure, we're also increasing the skill set in the system that's required to attack the system. Now, we know from our speakers and the, and the graph previously that cybersecurity is offense dominant. That means that if we train 10 hackers or 10 white hats and one of them decides to become a hacker and nine of them decide to become legitimate cybersecurity specialists, probably the net effect of security in the system is negative. Because that one hacker can do more damage than all nine of those white hats trying to protect the system. Slide. Finally, on the pure and clean ethics part of the, of the um, conference, ultimately we will not address this issue uh, without both a strong system of uh, more offensive measures against the hackers, whether that be surveillance, taking them out with drones as we did in Syria, um, using economic sanctions. We need to use strong offensive measures against the hackers, but also the best defense, in addition to the offense, on this issue is encouraging a eth more ethical approach among our young, among any vulnerable populations to this type of, of pursuit, hacking, uh, and that's going, to, that's going to be a very deep process of education, which is why we're here in part at Harvard. So thank you very much. It's an honor to speak to you. Thanks, Andrews, very much. Okay, um, we've got a number of folks who uh, are here as discussants, but you're all discussants, so I hope we can 
get on to a good, lively discussion of this issue. And I think we've got folks out there who can email questions and comments, Twan, into us in the course of this, and we'll pick those up as well. Um, and let me just make sure we have all of the folks that we think uh, are here. Bill Ottman, where are you? Bill, great to see you. Michael Solmeyer. Michael, are you with us? Thank you for joining us. Uh, Professor Hirotaka Takeuchi, with us? No? Uh, Steve Walt, welcome. And, um, and General Nguyen, who I know is with us. So let's start, Bill, with you. If, do you? Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. This is, uh, it's really interesting in the context of purity, you know, what does a pure internet mean? Because it very well means very different things to different people. So let's do it. Um, I'm, by the way, Bill Ottman. I'm a fellow of Boston Global Forum, and I'm also the co-founder of Minds.com. So there's the internet. <laughs> Keep going. All right, so to me, a pure internet is a free and open source infrastructure. And so this is the stack of the internet. So we have the bandwidth, the information, the data, the software, the hardware, the encryption, and the energy source that is actually powering the internet. So we're seeing <coughs> open source software start to take over as uh, especially dominant in the private sector, but slowly entering public. We have 11 <coughs> nations who have adopted some sort of open source policy, meaning that they're using software that they don't necessarily have to buy for millions and millions of dollars or be reliant on a third party to support it. Uh, India just has adopted an <coughs> open source policy for a lot of their infrastructure. The US has some policies, for instance, whitehouse.gov is using Drupal, and there's some data sharing going on, but the fact is that we have tools now to be sharing so much more data that is publicly funded, so much more technology that's publicly funded, and it's we're in the only, obviously only in the very beginning stages. So 11 nations, we have hundreds of nations, Every nation needs to be participating in free and open source infrastructure. So open, soft, open source creates software worth billions of dollars. We all know about Linux. Linux is becoming the, well, GNU slash Linux, is becoming the predominant operating system powering servers and people's personal, personal computers all over the world. Um, open source encryption doesn't mean, just because something is transparent, doesn't mean that it is compromising security. This is sort of a misperception. Uh, Gov.uk, open source, it's an example of soft power, which we were talking about a lot at the last conference. When you are transparent, it makes the world respect you, generally speaking. Um, all right, next slide. So closed source proprietary infrastructure. When you don't have access to the source code, you can't expect it, ins inspect it for backdoors or security vulnerabilities. Like I said, you're relying on third parties for support and development. Um, I know personal instances of the US government taking out multi-million dollar contracts for security software and actually never really used it. And then it's in, they were relying on that third party for support because they couldn't themselves inspect the code that they bought. Um, it limits in innovation. The beauty of open source is that, and free software, is that the whole world is able to, 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 to develop it in a collaborative way. You don't have rights to the technology, and proprietary encryption cannot be proved to be truly secure. Next. So in terms of access to bandwidth, access to the internet itself, this is a great quote from a friend and advisor of mine, Eben Moglen. What free bandwidth means is that we ought to have a right to communicate equally using the electromagnetic spectrum that belongs to all of us. Instead, 
Governments pretend that they own it, or Mr. Murdoch owns it, Mr. Berlusconi, or the Deutsche Telekom owns it. The result is that we pay to be connected to one another's minds. And that means we can only be as connected as we can afford, which means that poor people and people who are disfavored in societies in which they live don't have the ability to speak, and we need to change that. Eben Moglen, he works at the Software Freedom Law Center and was one of the creators of the general public license, which is the most common free software license used all throughout the world. Free software, what is free software? Free software means software that respects users' freedom and community. Roughly, it means that users have the freedom to run, copy, distribute, study, change, and improve the software. Thus, free software is a matter of liberty, not price. To understand the concept, you should think of free as in free speech, not as in free beer. We sometimes call it Libre software to show that we do not mean it is gratis. This is a little bit of the confusion of language in the free software world, but people mistake free in uh, thinking that it means price, but it's actually a matter of liberty. Free hardware. So these are the different layers, software, hardware, bandwidth. Free hardware, the actual data centers that are powering our global infrastructure. Open hardware, or open source hardware, refers to design specifications of a physical object which are licensed in such a way that said object can be studied, modified, created, and distributed by anyone. Even for the safety of our own government's infrastructure, if, if we don't have access to inspect it, we're buying those devices from third parties that could have access. So from any country's national security perspective, it matters to have greater access. Encryption. There's a new UN report out that says encryption tech is crucial for human rights, along with the right to anonymity. Obviously, there are two sides to this, to this conversation, because certain amounts of surveillance are necessary, for good reason, but also, when you compromise encryption, you're compromising the security of everybody, not just the people that you're trying to gain access to. When we were here the other week, uh, we went to MIT and checked out their new report called Keys Under Doormats. Mandating insecurity by requiring government access to all data and communications. Bruce Schneier, uh, who we talked with earlier, has been a huge proponent saying that open source cryptography is essential for good security. The US government actually increases its funding for Tor, giving it $1.8 million. This is somewhat of a paradox because Tor is a privacy tool that people all over the world use to maintain anonymity online. We have certain parts of the US government who are saying that we need to compromise encryption. But then meanwhile, the US government is also partially funding Tor. So it's just a really interesting conversation. Um, Let's Encrypt is a campaign that's being backed by dozens of corporations and nonprofits that is trying to give everyone HTTPS for free. We have to get HTTPS going on uh, the Boston Global Forum website ASAP. <laughs> uh, next. Open source encryption. In the cryptography world, we consider open source necessary for good security. We have for decades. Public security is always more secure than proprietary security. It's true for cryptographic algorithms, security protocols, and security source code. For us, open source isn't just a business model, it's smart engineering practice. Freedom of information. So 95 countries around the world have impl implemented some form of freedom of information legislation. There's a new uh, FOIA bill going through, well, that may go through, called the Oversight and Implement Implementation Act of 2015. Uh, open <coughs> data, so Creative Commons and other open licensing options are, are really important for governments, individuals to be aware of. Most people don't even understand that the content that we're uploading online can be given a variety of licenses. When you upload your content to Facebook or YouTube or wherever, what is that license? Who controls it? What rights are you giving away? Would it not be better to have greater degree of control over the future of your data? Um, reforming whistleblower laws, transparency increases security. Uh, there's, fr freedom of information is really, 
at the root of of security worldwide because when <laughs> it's 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 just that paradox that that needs to be revolved around you think that the more secret you are the more secure you are but really that that isn't the way that we participate in public forums we, you know the beauty of being able to have a public forum like this is to talk about the issues, be fully transparent about what you're saying, and that is how we move forward. Next. And then finally, we have what powers the internet? What is actually pure? You know, the data centers are, are consuming some of the most energy of, of any industry in the world. And the source of that energy is often very impure. So when we're talking about a free internet, a clean internet, a pure internet, we obviously have to be powering it with renewable energy. Uh, Microsoft, Apple, and Google are doing so, um, but I think we still need to do much better. I do not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Evelyn Beatrice Hall. All right, thanks everybody very much. I look forward to talking more. Okay, we've got a good amount of time here for a good discussion around the table, and, and I hope with some of the folks that are joining us from around the world. Um, Steve Wall, let's start with you. I don't think you have to come up here. Just soon keep the discussion going. How are we going to do this? Is that mic live, or is that oh, okay. one how we're going to use it? So give, you a th give us your thoughts, and I want to go to Michael Sulmeyer, and then I'll around the table. Terrific. I am not a cybersecurity person, and uh, in fact, if you pushed me really hard, I would argue that the problem has been somewhat exaggerated in at least a lot of the popular discourse. Having said that, the problem is not a trivial one, and so I think the effort that's being made here to try and develop a code of conduct is, is terrific. Um, and I want to say, uh, I want to make my contribution primarily about codes of conduct in general and how they develop, how they spread, what leads them to be adopted and eventually uh, internalized. If you think of this as a, essentially the development of a set of norms of behavior that states and corporations and NGOs and individuals would increasingly adhere to, there's actually a pretty large literature in the foreign policy and international affairs uh, field on how that process happens in a wide variety of realms, and I'm going to be borrowing from that in particular from the work of one of my colleagues at the Kennedy School, Catherine Sickink, who has done an enormous amount of work on how norms emerge, develop, uh, and spread. And she talks about three uh, main stages here. Uh, the first one is norm emergence, right? People begin to recognize that there's a problem, that it's a problem that needs some kind of regulation, some kind of uh, guidance. Uh, it's gradually understood, and at some point, entrepreneurs, individuals, start developing ideas for how this problem might be addressed, what a code of conduct might be. In a sense, that's what the Global Forum is trying to do. It's trying to be the norm entrepreneur developing this new set of ideas. Um, this involves a certain amount of consciousness raising, which is what we're all here doing today. It involves developing and amassing information. We already saw some uh, presented to us earlier. If you think about what groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and the entire human rights movement did beginning uh, after World War II, it was essentially creating new norms, developing information, consciousness raising, etc., to try and get people engaged by the process or, or engaged in an understanding that this problem needed uh, to be addressed. So that's stage one, and I'd argue that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, second stage, very important, she calls a norm cascade. This is the point at which the norm starts to take off. Other people begin to embrace it, other groups and organizations buy into this. And the classic example of this in the literature is the Landmines Convention, which begins with a bunch of NGOs and a bunch of entrepreneurs saying that we really ought to regulate and restrict and eventually stop the production of landmines, and gradually it becomes a worldwide movement. Uh, this involves networking with other organizations and groups. Uh, it requires developing a norm that has some legitimacy, that is seen as persuasive, that has uh, lots of potential winners, relatively few losers. Uh, 
ideas that are seen as compatible with existing norms. So for example, a global code of conduct for cybersecurity that was completely contrary to our basic notions of individual freedom would have trouble getting started because it would be in such tension with other things we already uh, embraced. Uh, a couple of other things that tend to lead norm cascades to happen. Sometimes a key event, a triggering event that captures a lot of global attention. The bad news here is what we really would need is a really awful cyber event that suddenly woke everybody up. So I'm not wishing for that, but that's the kind of thing one should try to take advantage of if it were to occur. And finally, getting prominent supporters behind it, whether it's powerful countries, powerful corporations, prominent individuals, in the landmines case, Princess Diana of Great Britain became a key advocate, and because she was such a visible public figure, that helped uh, things take off uh, as well. So the next stage, of course, again, when this starts to take off, and the third stage um, she calls norm internalization. And this is really what the long-term goal is. It's when the principle is so, or the set of principles is so well established, it, um, that first of all, violating them is understood to be a crime even by those who are doing it, right? Everyone now recognizes the right and wrong here. Uh, second, it's fully embraced and embedded in domestic law. So it's not just a set of principles that is issued by the Boston Global Forum, but those principles begin to be adopted and written into the domestic laws of other countries, possibly written into international conventions. Now, needless to say, we are not there yet. Uh, this requires a lot of hard, <coughs> grassroots political work at the you know, international, but also at the local level, I suspect. Uh, and let me just end with one final comment here, uh, which I think probably all of you know. Uh, norms do not work 100% of the time, even if they are fully developed, fully internalized. People violate traffic laws on a daily basis, but fortunately, most people observe almost all traffic laws almost all the time, which is why we can have a, a, you know, a functioning highway system here. So the bottom line here is that a code of conduct cannot be the only tool in the cybersecurity toolkit, but it's going to have to be a critical part of it. And, that, and for that reason, I applaud the effort that the forum is making. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, before we go to Michael, just, uh, you know, when you get to my advanced age, uh, you've seen a lot, you've experienced a good deal. And these days, people obviously very concerned about this, invasion of privacy, these kinds of things. Uh, I happen to go to a small Quaker college called Swarthmore outside of Philadelphia, way back in the 50s. And uh, graduated in 55 and, and was drafted. And uh, arrived at Fort Dix as a young draftee with about 25 or 30 other characters who all took that fatal step forward to the Fargo building in South Boston. And uh, three days after I got there, I had what passed in those days for personnel interview, in which another draftee, who was a personnel specialist, interviewed you and then decided where you'd go for the next nearly two years. Um, my interviewee had a name tag, and it said Harry Kane III. Now, Harry Kane Jr. was the right-wing Republican United States Senator at the time from state of Washington. And uh, there were an awful lot of people sitting around Fort Dix uh, at that time who had been drafted who were being held indefinitely because they were members of this organization or that organization. And um, Harry Kane III, who was my personnel interviewer, had a file in his lap with every single political activity I'd engaged in at Swarthmore College. I mean, who was I? I was this Greek kid from Boston who was down at Swarthmore. I'd never been out of New England in those days. You didn't kind of get on a plane and go places. And um, uh, I didn't know a shaker from a Quaker when I got down there. But it was an interesting experience. Um, he knew that I had been the chairman of the Students for Democratic Action, that I'd run a fundraising drive the American Civil Liberties Union. I mean, all this was in a file. And this was in pre-computer America. Um, it wasn't until several years later that we all discovered how he and others had this information, the FBI had a tap on the Swarthmore switchboard. And uh, since that was the only way you could make a phone call in and out of the place, we didn't have individual phones, obviously we didn't have cell phones. I guess the Federal Bureau of Investigation was listening in on every single conversation that took place during the four years that I was there. Um, and that's how they had all this information on me. Fortunately, it didn't 
send me over to the barracks with all these folks who were facing other than honorable discharges. Uh, and they were nice enough to send me to Munsan, Korea, where I spent 16 months. It was an interesting 16 months. But this, this problem, folks, has been with us for a long time. Um, and it's not that it's important. Obviously, it's very important. But it's important, at least to, from the standpoint of those of us who are elderly, to remember that we faced this before, and we've obviously got work to do. Now, Michael Solmar. Oh, good morning. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to join. And I think the combination of uh, Professor Walt's caution that maybe there's a little bit here that's overblown with the uh, powerful historical reminder that it's not just the interweb that uh, leads to these problems, right? I mean, you can have surveillance before the, the interwebs. You can have surveillance after. It's not just uh, an, an internet or cyberspace kind of issue. What, what I think is needed, though, is a little bit more precision, a little bit more nuance when we're actually describing the current state of affairs and the threat. So let me offer two and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. The first is you've heard some comments this morning that cyberspace is offense dominant. Uh, and while I would be inclined to say in some situations it is, um, sometimes the best defense is actually a little better defense. And I, I wouldn't want to miss that point because if you're focusing on a purely offensive strategy, you are also completely underplaying what you can do to better defend yourself. The state of defense right now across so many enterprises is so bad that even incremental steps to improve it end up making a lot of difference against your basic nudneck hackers. I'm not saying you'll be able to defend yourself against every single sophisticated bad guy out there, but that's not what you face. You're not facing every single sophisticated bad guy out there. A lot of times, we're facing the junior varsity team. But because our defenses are even worse than redshirt freshmen, the JV team runs the table. That is not a call for an offense dominant strategy. You can do a lot on defense to make yourself even a little bit better. All right? That is an important principle that I want to stress here and not let that get lost in the nuance. Uh, Two-factor authentication. All right. It is not a panacea. It will not stop everyone from doing everything, but it's free. <laughs> Google offers it for free. Facebook offers it for free. How many of y'all around the table turn this thing on? Not many, I suspect. Why? I'm not sure. But the reality is there are solutions out there that are not costly that can protect all of us as individuals and as companies and as enterprises and just up the game a little. <coughs> we should at least have to make the bad guys work a little harder. And that is uh, the point that I want to make sure everyone leaves here with is we don't have to break the bank. We don't need to hire the absolute best skilled talent in the planet to come run cyber offense for Harvard or for the faculty club or for the Boston Global Forum. The other element I'd like to focus on uh, substantively is uh, this question about backdoors and encryption. You've heard both sides of a conversation this morning. One side saying you got to have mandated backdoors into encryption for national security and law enforcement purposes. You heard another side saying, well, okay, if you do that, you weaken the security of the entire ecosystem for everybody. So go in knowing full well that if you mandate backdoors, that's the same door that uh, all the bad guys can use, from the JV team to the very, very varsity uh, senior team. What I would just note is uh, we have yet to hear a real clarification of how you work with uh, crypto that is outside U.S. jurisdiction. So the calls to mandate backdoors say we need a law in the United States that mandates any designer of encryption in the United States creates a backdoor for government. Okay, so as soon as I know that a U.S. company is doing that, why would I use any U.S. company's encryption? Why wouldn't I just go to a foreign company's encryption? They're not subject to the laws of the United States. So we need a, to have a little bit more of a nuanced conversation about the fact that this isn't just a, a U.S. problem that U.S. laws and regulations can fix just on our own. 
we, we should try. I'm not saying we shouldn't try. It's a very serious problem. I used to work for the Defense Department. I'm, I'm one of the most uh, offense, security-minded, hard power guys you're going to find in this area. But I don't think you can just offense and law your way through it. Um, the other element we need to think about is, so you go through the trouble of actually decrypting all this information. You got your haystack. What are you going to do with it? How do you actually integrate all that information into a picture that's sufficiently timely to act? All right? The little bit of information that we've heard come out after the horrific Paris attacks is that the planners were communicating over SMS in the open, not encryption. And it was still not caught. It was still not integrated into the broader threat picture and then operationalized. I'm not trying to tell you encryption isn't important. It's an important debate we should be having, and I'm glad we're having it. What I also want to make sure we recognize is that once we all come in our minds to resolving it, the problem's just beginning. Now you have to figure out actually what to do with it. How do you actually get this information in a sufficiently timely way to the folks who need it? That's a, a powerful, uh, even just you get a research agenda going around those two issues, and uh, you're at the forefront. Of, of the community right now. Uh, I would also note, though, that we've got some, some wonderful students working in this area. Scarlett sitting next to me at uh, Northeastern is uh, just a rock star totally coming on. And uh, terrific uh, young faculty uh, as well, and Ryan and Jackie, who are here too. So uh, that's the largest, most positive takeaway I would have for you, is that from students to faculty and others, uh, the field is really going to be in a really good shape I think in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, thanks to the people, some of whom are around the table today. Thank very, you. very reassuring. Thanks, Michael. Okay, let's have a good round table. We've got a fair amount of time here, and uh, uh, who wants to begin? Thoughts, comments? And Anders. I'll just, I'll just reply on two of the points. Hold on a second. Do we need a microphone? Pass that up, folks. It's okay. You can sit. You can sit. I'll just reply on two of the points you made. One is, why not use non-U.S. encryption? Well, it's a, if it's illegal to use non-U.S. encryption or non-backdoor encryption in the U.S., if you have non-U.S. encryption or non-backdoor encryption on your phone, you're going to jail. That's why. So, you know, is, is there going to be imperfect enforceability of that? No. But will it decrease use of that type of encryption? Yes. Second point um, is that major banks in New York City, with whom I've spoken with in terms of their cybersecurity, are covering 1% of their risk surface. It's simply too expensive for them to fully cover with defensive means all of their risks. So an incremental improvement might be to 2%. Well, frankly, that's not enough. We have to go after the, cyber, the, the, the offenders. We cannot simply rely on defense. That's it. Thanks, Sanders. OK, more comments. So just to follow up on the last comment, um, I, I find the encryption point really perplexing. So the notion that you would somehow, through legal means, ensure that folks were either using U.S. products where they were backdoored or not, it just doesn't seem feasible. And, and your point, I, I guess it, it makes some sense if what you're really worried about is conducting surveillance within the borders of the U.S. on U.S. folks who are aligned with and using U.S. companies, but that's just simply not the case. That's not the challenge. So I, I found that point just unusual. and just. As a reminder, following up on what Michael said and what Bruce said earlier, I think we have a lot more to lose by weakening defenses and putting all our eggs in the offensive basket than we certainly do to have to gain. All of our eggs. I'm saying we need to significantly increase our offensive capability. Well, and I would also point out that doing that would create enormous risks of destabilization. So if you really want financial institutions to invest heavily in offense, no, US, so government, US government offense. Well, I, I, I really, you know, I think it's great that we're having the conversation and thinking about the value of offense in cyberspace, but just as a reminder that certainly we could do better on defense and that investing in offense has enormous risks. And certainly in the U.S. we have great offensive capabilities beyond cyber that are incredibly effective for deterrence as well. So uh, just a, a note of caution. Tell us who you are, by the way. Sorry, uh, Ryan Ellis. I'm a new faculty member over at Northeastern. Great. And where were you, Ryan, before you arrived here? At Harvard, here at the Kennedy School. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Okay, who's next? And tell us who you are. Hey, Bill, just a quick comment. So in regards to what Anders was saying about Bitcoin as well, uh, another fellow at the Boston Global Forum here, his name's, her name is Roya uh, Mahboub, and she's an Afghani entrepreneur. And she was part of an organization with uh, Fereshte Furrow, who I work with at Code to Inspire, which empowers women in Afghanistan to learn to code. And what they were doing with Women's Annex was actually helping them earn money, earn Bitcoin online because they're unable to participate in the global economy in Afghanistan. So Bitcoin is Bitcoin and, and encryption are actually very similar debates. People want to ban Bitcoin. People want to ban encryption. It's, it's not possible. It's, these are open source frameworks that exist. They're not controlled by any central authority. <coughs> and also, Bitcoin is being used for many other purposes other than just money. It's uh, used for smart contracts. The blockchain is a technology that major banks are starting to use to help with their ledgers. Um, the New York Stock Exchange just invested like $70 million in Coinbase, which is a major Bitcoin exchange. Okay. Thanks. Who's next? Tell us who you are. Hi, Jackie Kerr. I'm a fellow at the Belfer Center. Um, and um, I actually, it's relevant also, I last year was at Stanford in Silicon Valley as a fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Um, I wanted to say a word about the uh, issue of education of people in, in relevant skills. Um, being at CSAC last year at Stanford saw numerous people come through to discuss the issues of national security and cybersecurity and the need for more um, educated um, individuals who had the abilities to work in this space and how important that was uh, to develop the relationship with the people who could had the skills um, for the purposes of national security. Um, Anders made the comment that training people in these sorts of skills that are relevant uh, is dangerous, but I'm wondering how, if the goal is to increase either defense or offense capabilities, how we get there if we, if we don't train people in the relevant skills, and um, how we avoid falling behind those who would wish to do harm, um, either state or non-state actors, if we intentionally stall in developing the capabilities ourselves. Thanks. Andrews? I want, to, I want to pass that mic microphone I, I up. Super yeah. quickly, uh, that, uh, you know, maybe, <coughs> hacking, maybe hacking skills are like tow missiles. It's something that you want in the hands of the military only. Or maybe uh, hacking skills are something uh, that's a, uh, some, something similar to a police weapon, like a semi-automatic weapon. You really only want uh, SWAT teams that are controlled by governments to have those skills. You don't want to diffuse those skills broadly into the community. How is that possible? Got me all shaken up. Yeah, my name's uh, Mark Harding. I am CTO at, My at Mines with Bill. Uh, yeah, I just want to counter what you said about, you know, it should be only you know the governments who should be able to hack or whatever, but people can learn it themselves. There's all this stuff on the internet, and people can self-teach themselves how to code. And the idea that you know it's own you know people are always bad. You know people can hack for good. People can tell other sites what vulnerabilities they have, so they can resolve those issues as well. So you know you can't stop people hacking because they can find out how to do it themselves. It's not something that has to be taught through ec um, academic establishments. Other comments? Uh, my name is Mario, I'm from Mozambique, and uh, I'm a photographer. Oh, well, for me, um, well, I feel a little bit out of the contest just for um, uh, because of the reality from where I'm coming from. So uh, Mozambique is a new country, and about 80% of the um, uh, population, they don't have a formal education. So I think that uh, um, 
for me, like uh, the question that always comes on my mind, for example, is that um, imagine like uh, people that are struggling every day, like looking for job and opportunities, you know. So when you talk about internet and um, internet and a new technology for local population, they don't have an idea about what you're talking about, and uh, every day. Today, like about 200 or 150 uh, billion of emails that we're sending, 90% is a spam, and uh, and these affects like uh, to local population in Mozambique because everyone there is being out looking for job, even young people, and uh, that's why like most of most of young people they any risk for what has been circulated online by the mafia groups or um, I don't know. So I think that. Um, for me, the most important things about uh, how to adopt the strategy to educate uh, the local population there, because even even if uh, even if uh, um, we're talking about the government, as you say, like uh, um, to, I don't know, like to to try to involve the local population, it's very complicated, you know. But how how that how that we can adopt the strategy uh, that we can include uh, those. Those people, the, the majority, I'm not talking about US or in the West, but most people in Africa, when you talk about internet, they don't know. The, the generation of my parents, if you talk about Viber, if you talk about Facebook, they don't have an idea about what you're talking about. Uh, some young people, like my friends, they know what is Facebook, they know what is email, and they have it, but they don't have any interest in on sending email just to greet. They use internet to look for job and opportunities. And when you're talking about US and Europe, they want to come, you know, so if you send an email like, oh, hey, I have this business, I, I want to bring you here, that's, they, they, will, they will give credibility to it, you know. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Any other comments? Yeah. Steve, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, just a couple of things. One is a question. I, the, I heard something this morning that has me slightly puzzled, and that was the comment that corp the corporate world is underinsured against this problem. Uh, I'm willing to believe that corporations are occasionally collectively stupid, but it's hard to believe that if the problem is as big as some maintain, that corporations haven't insured themselves to a level that they are reasonably comfortable with. And so does that tell us something about the true nature of how dangerous this is to corporations that they're not spending an enormous amount of money trying to insure themselves against this problem because they don't see it as a problem. They understand they're going to pay some price for it. They understand there's going to be some inconveniences and costs, but it's not worth spending a huge amount of money to cover themselves against all that. And please just inform me because I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled by that. <coughs> and that gets to the second problem that I alluded to at the very beginning of my remarks. Um, how are we going to measure this? What's, what's all, uh, the measure the <coughs> true extent of the problem. What's always troubled me about this is this is one of those realms where you need a lot of technical knowledge to really understand the issues carefully. And there are an awful lot of people in the business who have an interest in making sure we're all really scared about it. Anybody who sells antivirus software, anybody who is a, uh, a cybersecurity consultant, anybody who wants to sell a book on the subject, generally wants to get people as alarmed as possible. I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong, but there's an awful lot of people in that business, and there's relatively little money to be made saying to everybody, eh, relax, it's not that bad. So how do we appraise, given that most of us don't have a technical background that allows us to assess these claims, how do we appraise it? I've, I've been wanting for years now to have a genuinely sort of bipartisan, objective, a uh, task force on this to try and give us a well-informed and honest appraisal of how serious the problem is, one that includes both people from the cybersecurity industry, but also some well-informed people who don't necessarily have money in the game. Roll that baby over here. Thanks. Dick, tell us who you are. Uh, Dick Pirazzolo. I'm on the editorial board of uh, Boston <coughs> Global Forum, and I run a public relations firm, so I thought I would um, comment in terms of brand and brand building. Uh, you know, we have a, I, I know that, you know, everybody can't uh, hide under a, hide under a rock fearing uh, either a cyber attack or somebody's going to leave a satchel bomb um, in the, uh, in the, clo in the cloakroom. Um, but I think there, I think there's a cost of rebuilding a brand that may not be included 
uh, when, you, when you think about a company being hacked. And the uh, perfect example is TJX Corporation, which um, operates uh, four retail outlets. They were notified by the FBI that they, had, they were being hacked. They didn't even know it. Um, and then even after uh, sufficient experts swept the entire system for bugs, uh, the hackers were able to leave a tiny bit of code on their computers um, such that it would just go on and off every once in a while and would collect a few, um, a few um, uh, credit card numbers at a time. And so it, was, it took a long time before they even ferreted that out. Um, you know, in terms of understating, overstating the problem, um, you know, it's probably half the people in this room have had their credit card hacked. I have, in fact, uh, I just bought $1,300 worth of cloud services from Amazon, and my wife uh, gave somebody a refrigerator who lives in Estonia. And we don't take these very seriously because you call up the credit card company and they say, oh, we'll take care of it, and the problem goes away. But uh, imagine if we were on the hook for all those costs, I think we would uh, might have a different uh, view of the severity of the problem because it is so pervasive. So I will pass the mic to anyone else who wishes to comment. Tell us, tell us who you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry. My name is Nguyen Pham. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow from the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton University. Uh, uh, still is the Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important forums. Uh, I do not have a uh, background in uh, IT or, or cyber security, uh, but I think that it's a very complex uh, problem and it depends a lot on the development of technologies. But from my legal background, I can say that uh, uh, there are two main issues that we need to put into consideration when dealing with uh, cyber security. The first that we have to uh, consider the relationship between the public interest and uh, uh, individual human rights, the uh, confidence of uh, uh, private life of uh, people and the public interest. The second thing is that um, uh, I think there's something similarity between the cyber security and, and, uh, and climate change because uh, for environmental issue, you do not have border. Uh, it's same like for the uh, for the cyber war. You do not have border, so it's the uh, mm, because it do not have border. So you need to uh, have the support and um, and the commitment from all over country in the world to deal with the cyber security. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan Manis from uh, Northeastern University, colleague of go the Governor Caucuses. Uh, I want to get back to this um, offense dominant talk. Um, what I do in my research is I look at the past and, and make, make predictions for the future. So let's look at the two maybe more, most offensive dominant uh, cyber attacks we've seen. One is Stuxnet, the other is maybe Shamoon on uh, Saudi Arabia um, that was supposedly from Iran, but they denied it. So that's one, what's one issue? If, if offense is dominant, then why are states denying these, these overt attacks? The United States and Israel denied it for a, for a while before it came to bear that it actually was the United States. And then let's look at the impact that these attacks really did have. Did Stuxnet deter the Iranians from, from uh, developing nuclear weapons? Um, it's hard to say, but I would say no. And what did um, Shamoon do in the long run for uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, oil industry. It didn't do that much damage. Um, so these policy impacts is what we're talking about. And also I want to say that um, <laughs> we, we like to focus on what on, on data breaches rather than those that are deterred. Um, kind of like we do with terrorism that uh, we, we never talk about when the terrorist attacks have been deterred. We only talk about when it happens and we like to focus on that. I think that's something we also need to think about when we're looking at cybersecurity as well. How many times have, are we blocking these offensive type weapons from breaching our networks. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Let me raise a broader issue, if I can, before we uh, wrap things up. Um, we've got this problem. Steve, it may be serious, it may not be serious, uh, but it's out there. Um, and at least 
this country is going to be spending billions, according to General Alexander, who was the head of the National Security Agency, on um, offensive cyber teams. I don't know how much that's going to cost, but as somebody who is uh, also very concerned about uh, our ability to invest in important domestic investments, that's money that's going someplace else. And presumably other governments are doing exactly the same thing. Um, what do we do about that? Um, is there a way to um, not only talk about an international code of conduct, but a set of rules that could be effectively implemented, which would make it less necessary, or maybe even unnecessary, for us and lots of other governments to spend uh, a ton of money on this thing in a new form of warfare. Uh, and what are the prospects for that? And who, who should we look to to do that, to lead that effort? Uh, or is this just one of those things where we're just going to let the music play and uh, essentially accept uh, a new reality, which is that um, this is something else that taxpayers and governments are going to have to put a lot of money into, which means that those monies and those investments cannot be made in things that I think most of us would think would be significantly more important in improving the quality of life of our fellow citizens. How about that? How about that? And presumably, at least the Secretary General of the UN is interested. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been nice enough to send us a statement. How do we approach that? And who's doing anything about it these days? I mean, I gather there's some small office at the UN that's working on this, and we've had occasional international conferences uh, here and there. But uh, Ryan, that doesn't strike me as being uh, a particularly uh, satisfying answer to what there's going to be another arms race in which we spend billions and trillions, uh, offensively, defensively, or otherwise. How about that? And maybe, I mean, is this something that the Boston Global Forum, among other organizations, might at least try to stimulate, not just by having a meeting here and talking about a code of conduct, but by uh, seeking to stimulate serious action across the globe and among governments as well as good people who like me, are a little concerned about uh, this. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, it's a, a great uh, call to diplomacy as opposed to call to arms, and I think that's, that's really nicely said. What I would submit to all of you here is that uh, this is maybe one of the rare times government is on the case. Um, you know, I, I just left five years in Washington seeing how federal government has responded to uh, the call you've just made. The State Department's office, just as an example, uh, that is charged with leading and generating an international negotiation posture around the very issues you just articulated, has grown faster than I think any other State Department office that, that I'm aware of, and everyone else looks at cyber with envy across the federal government. So government is responding, and that's why this- Can I interrupt for a second? Tell us a little bit about the details of that. Sure. So the What's the office? Uh, how rapidly you say it's, it's been growing rapidly? Uh, I mean, I don't have a sense at this point in time that my government or any other government uh, is aggressively pursuing the kind of thing that we're talking about, at least that I've suggested, but maybe I'm wrong. The U.S. government basically just hold, held hostage uh, an entire state visit from Xi Jinping to uh, very aggressive Chinese cyber operations and with a, a very clear threat of rough sanctions that were going to come if there wasn't a deal made. So and they've acted on it. Wh whether or not anyone's acted on it, whether or not it'll be implemented in good faith, who knows. But what I am trying to indicate to you is, is maybe some form of optimism that the, the U.S. government gets it. This is a new challenge for a lot of leaders. There's going to be a lot of errors. And unlike most other national security challenges, the role of the private sector here cannot be uh, better called out. Um, the, so much internet infrastructure is owned by private companies. 
even if you could get complete coherence across the federal government on the right idea, <laughs> it solves about 10% of the problem because you also have to get private sector companies, not just Facebook, but telco companies, the whole lot of them to play ball also. So it's a really thorny challenge, but what I'm trying to indicate to you is, again, by really threatening to hold hostage a state-level visit from Xi Jinping, from an executive order that now for the first time ever authorizes a new kind of sanctions against companies and countries that perpetrate malicious acts against us, indictments against malicious hackers abroad, um, an investment, as you said, sir, a uh, huge military force structure for not just offense, but also defensive operations in cyberspace too. Uh, I look at all this, you know, coming up here to Harvard and getting a chance to think a little broader and say, wow, just because we, we probably need to publicize it a little bit more. We probably need to explain it a little bit better to everyone. But government is not completely asleep at the switch, I think, as, as much as we might think walking away from here. I won't go into Steve's fantastic questions about insurance right now, but these are great questions also that touch on the private sector and talk with you about it offline. But let me ask you this, Michael. To what extent are we trying to use our leadership to internationalize this problem? I mean, I understand this relationship with the United States and China is a very, very important bilateral relationship, and uh, we got to be taking it very seriously, and that includes who's doing what to whom when it comes to cyber. But it strikes me that one of the things the United States ought to be doing is really getting it up there and, uh, as I say, trying to internationalize this thing and begin to get serious about developing institutions, rules, a combination of those that... Um, might conceivably make it less necessary that we have to spend billions on this stuff. What do you think? Uh, and what are we doing about it? A great, great point. So it's a good opportunity to talk about the work that our State Department has led at the United Nations with uh, a group that's called the Group of Governmental Experts. Tell us about that. Right, that convenes on a regular basis to address a particular topic that is of concern in international cybersecurity. A year or two ago, we actually got all the members of the group of governmental experts, about 20 leading countries, to agree that the laws of war apply in cyberspace. Right? The Russians and the Chinese also agree with this. Now, you can first you could look at that and say, so what? Uh, but I'm trying to indicate to you that there is a, a process being led here through the United Nations that the United States is playing a very important role in to try to get consensus around these core principles. And so you can't just, cyber is not the wild, wild west. But the United States is not the only actor here. The Russians and the Chinese have another idea about how international governance should work in this. And their main principle is content control. They would love to see international governance of the internet. They would love to see peace and stability on the internet. That allows them to take down content they find objectionable. Right? We have a problem with that. I think a lot of countries have a problem with that. So this is not just a case where the United States can get up on a stage and propound and lead. We have to combat aggressively a counter movement that wishes to take the internet in areas that I don't think are, are consistent at all with a lot of values that, that we all share here today. How do we get more visibility behind this effort? Uh, I mean, the, I, I've just I mean, read I'm large just, everything. I'm just one guy that reads the newspaper and tries yeah. to stay informed. Um, and a lot of this is new to me in terms of what we're doing. I mean, isn't it time to kind of get it up there in light so we begin to... It's, it's difficult. I'm a turbo nerd. You know, I, I built computers in my mom's attic, you know, when I was growing up. So I love this stuff. I mean, I, I eat it up. But one of the things that I, I think you'll, you'll see a couple of things. First, the presidential campaign season gives a lot of debate forum. There's been a lot of talk, oddly enough, about cybersecurity. It's a little chest thumpy, but candidates are mentioning it. So it is becoming a broader part of the domestic political discourse. All right, so that's, that's one thing, and I think the, as the field winnows down, you'll have more concrete opportunities to hear them talk about uh, issues beyond just, um, you know, I will cyber attack anything that walks kind of language, which isn't helpful, but that's what we're hearing all right, so far. Um, secondly, the, the unauthorized disclosures by Snowden had a, a very chilling effect across 
a lot of different enterprises and governments that I think there was a trend towards greater transparency and openness in talking about it. That put a momentary, I think, pause on that transparency so that you could assess really what damage had occurred, what was going to occur. But I think we're now starting to, to come past that a little bit. And I think that the transparency spirit that uh, a lot of countries feel is necessary in this space is slowly being re-energized. But that put a halt to a lot of, of efforts because you had to triage everything going on. So I, I see that getting better, but I'm, I share your, your frustration and disappointment on that, and I think we can all do a lot better on it. And unfortunately, I wasn't a nerd. Of course, we didn't have computers back in those days. But the reason I went into politics was because I got a charitable D in general physics at Swarthmore College and decided to do something else. Um, I'd never had that experience in my life. I mean, you just worked harder and you did better, right? Um, I just couldn't get it. So I'm in awe of those of you who get it, but uh, just as one citizen concerned about what I'm seeing and another race and another arms race and, and billions being spent on this stuff, and it strikes me that one of the things the world community has to do, and maybe the forum, this forum can help to stimulate this, is to see if we can't get control of this and, and get ourselves a very visible international process in which people are beginning to discuss, about, discuss these things and discuss ways of uh, maybe making it less necessary for governments to invest huge amounts of money in this stuff, offensively, defensively, or otherwise, as we try to come to some uh, conclusion. Anders. Uh, I just point out that the, um, I mean, making agreements in the UN is all well and good, and you know, a that? bureaucratic office and the State, State, State Department yeah. just lost tons of data to the Chinese, right? OPM lost tons of data to the Chinese. So what you're seeing is you see agreements that are being made, but then broken by the Chinese. The, the, the declar I, I do stuff in the South China Sea, Declaration of Conduct, totally broken by the Chinese. Minsk agreements in Ukraine, totally broken by the Russians. With, with the terrorists, there's no one to even negotiate with. So the, this kind of approach, to me, sounds naive. If you look at the history of what's going on with these agreements, they're made and then broken. And so we need to think of it as much as I would love, right, to have a more peaceful approach. The, um, the reality is that the major adversaries that we're facing are not taking a peaceful approach. They're taking a very militaristic approach, and it's forcing us to react, right? And so that's that is the situation. We've got a que we've got a question from out there in the big wide world from somebody who's. Uh, Who's a part of this? Uh, well, let me <clears throat> let me raise two questions. One is now that smartphones are more popular and continuing to increase, what is the top smartphone risk now? I assume for interference. What's the answer? What's the question again? So top smartphone risk. The top smartphone risk now. We deal a lot with mobile, um, mobile security and mobile uh, risk today. You know, you hear the term, there's an app for everything, there's an app for that. So I think one of the biggest risks we face today are um, apps that are being created in, in, in multiple environments and multiple, multiple ecosystems. Um, it, it amazes me how angry birds, when you install that, it asks permission to have access to your camera and have access to your microphone and your contact list. So a lot of these applications that are out there, um, we prefer convenience over security. So in order to benefit from the experience from all of these different apps that are out there, we are openly giving permission for all of these vendors to collect all the information on us. So when we're in New York City or we're here in Harvard, and something pops up on your, um, uh, on your screen from one of your applications that says, hey, there's a sale going on here at, uh, at, at a particular store. Well, it's tracking where you're going and you've given permission to do that. So I think those are some of the bigger risks that are being faced today um, because a lot of that information that's being collected is then being sold and or being stolen and being used for um, phishing scams and other types of uh, email campaigns to uh, to elicit bad activity. Okay. 
I just uh, wanted to quickly respond to Anders. Uh, with the Office of Personnel Management uh, leak that you were talking about, actually that data got leaked and it wasn't encrypted. So it's actually, and I agree with you in that it is a little bit naive to think that everyone around the world is just going to agree to these, uh, to all of these agreements. <laughs> But that is more reason to secure the infrastructure in the way that is being recommended by people like Bruce Schneier and all of the top security experts in terms of open source, foundation, and encryption everywhere. And then in, I wanted to respond to what you were saying about transparency and how pre-Snowden leak there was a trend of transparency and I just, I, I wasn't really recognizing that. Um, it seems like that caused more efforts for transparency to start beginning. And um, like recently we just saw the EU vote for uh, protection of Snowden in, uh, to give him asylum. So I, I think that there's tons more work to do with transparency and uh, yeah. Here's another one. Um, here's another one that uh, we've got uh, and I'm not sure I understand it, but let me repeat it. Do you think encrypted messaging apps should allow backdoor to encrypted communicate? <coughs> it's a little confusing here. Yes. Uh, uh, allow the government to monitor or stick, I gather, uh, our correspondent is telling us, with truly private privacy focus after the Paris attacks. Does that make any sense? What yeah. do you think? Or what do you say? Yes, we should have a back door to uh, encrypted messaging apps because uh, terrorists can use that. Not, obviously, some terrorists won't. Some terrorists will not have their stuff encrypted. But uh, for those smart terrorists, and those are the ones that we're especially worried about, we should definitely have back doors. To your point about OPM, government obviously should not have back doors that encrypted information. Legitimate governments need fully encrypted, no backdoor information. I'm only saying this about private use that could be used by the state. Time. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor Michael. Uh, now, about the, your uh, question of uh, how uh, internationally, collectively, uh, we can better address this issue. And I agree with you, uh, with your frustration, frustration of me around the table. Uh, uh, you know, and I agree with you, Daniel, the Boston Global Forum uh, definitely can uh, contribute to raising the profile of this issue, which you are already doing. And as, as you introduce a Prime Minister, uh, Japan will be chairing the G7 process, and we will be addressing this issue. But the complication of this issue, which uh, uh, is that this is not only the issues of, the, uh, of Japan, the United States, and uh, you know, seven uh, countries. Uh, this is also not only the issues of the, what the government uh, will do or can do. Uh, there are many lots of other people who are out there. Uh, so we need to uh, take a holistic approach. It's not you know put everything on one basket. No one is talking about it. So we have to take a sort of a multi uh, approach. And for that, the one thing I like to uh, uh, mention is. Uh, reaching out to the uh, broader uh, international community. Uh, as uh, Michael Governor, you introduced uh, Japan under Prime Minister's leadership, has uh, started the process of uh, capacity building, uh, helping uh, other like-minded countries, uh, including uh, Southeast Asian countries, to better deal with this issue collectively. So we like to expand the scope of uh, this uh, network and uh, you know what has been done uh, with a wonderful uh, U.S. Uh, initiative and leadership at the United Nations, that is very important. And he mentioned uh, number 20 of the countries. And uh, there is, uh, besides G7, there is a group of G20. Now, this includes uh, other uh, countries uh, like Brazil, uh, China, India, South Africa, and you know these are very important players. So and why aren't they and, and this year, oh, if I may just ahead, add, yeah. this year, well, in, in the next cycle, uh, 
Well, Japan will be the chair of the G7. G20 chair will be China. Hmm? So China will have a golden opportunity to play a constructive uh, role as a chair of the G20. So, you know, we can talk about it. You know, some people may be cynical about it, but I think this is, you know, worthwhile trying. And presumably, China would have an opportunity, along with the other 19, to get a serious discussion going. Because at this point, I think, Michael, it's largely a kind of Western European thing. I mean, this, this group at the UN uh, made up largely of countries from, from the US and Europe. Are there any other, who are the other countries that are part of this, this group that's meeting at the UN? The fact that Russia and China are the key representatives of the non-West, I think, is a really... They, they are part of that group yeah. as well. So these discussions are already going on. Right. Well, that's encouraging, I think. Um, one, or last, one or two last comments, maybe, before we wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want it, to... It's quite a, a broad church when we talk about cybersecurity and how to combat it. And we've kind of got two different things going on. We've got people talking about, like, almost state attacks between between each other, you know, you've got China and then the US. But then we've also got, you know, the encryption thing with, you know, people's personal and private lives, you know, that they ne don't necessarily want that to be exploited, which, which isn't related to the whole, you know, state battles that's going on with the, with the global government. So we kind of have to almost separate those from each other. Um, and just on the, on the, on the back door issue, um, it's, it's <coughs> I just wonder how, how that's going to be achieved, because the encryption exists already, <coughs> that people cannot hack it, because there are no backdoors. So are we saying we're going to just make that illegal? And if we make that illegal, then are the terrorists not just going to use the illegal stuff anyway, because they're criminals as they are? So, so it's, it's like, you know, people who obey the law are going to use the, the backdoor encryption. So I, I just wonder how we're, how we're going to get around the, the backdoor issue that seems to be proposed. Uh, I'd like to make some, just some comments here about what Michael said and Jackie said and Bill said about um, cybersecurity education awareness. Um, I think it's extremely important. Um, the human element is one of the weakest links in this entire process and I think that's part of the Boston Global Forum is, is, is sharing these ideas and talking about these types of things. Um, I, I think that um, Educating our youth um, in cybersecurity on both offensive and defensive is very important because unlike a lot of what we're seeing today in industry and in government is the bad guys are organized. They share, they're organized, and we are not as organized as they are. That's the reality. And Michael may understand, <laughs> understand this in the room, and I'll geek out for just a second, is the, it's a perhaps a rhetorical question, but has anybody ever seen what a polymorphic virus actually does? It is truly, to me, one of the eighth wonders of the world, how these things are so intelligent, how they dig deep, they attack systems, and the, the veracity is just astounding to me. So the threat is real, and it comes from all over. It comes from insiders, it comes from state-sponsored, it comes from <coughs> hacker groups, and if you've never been up against a hacker group, some of these more famous ones you read about in the press, they're very, very good. They're very organized, um, and again, the threat is real. I'm not selling what I call FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's more of an education process here of what we're actually up against and truly understanding the adversary because they're only getting better, um, and technology needs to keep pace with that, uh, as does policy and as does regulation around the world. Um, and it's a very complex issue. So I think to the core of part of what we're talking about and some of the sentiments that I agree with you guys is that education is key and educating people in cybersecurity. Okay. Well, this has been, at least for me, a very enlightening morning. And uh, I hope it gives us an opportunity and a platform to really take this up several notches here because uh, it strikes me that not only is it very important, but it's, it's time to get it up there. And I think we have an opportunity as 
part of the Boston Global Forum to do that. And uh, a huge thank you to all of you for being a part of that. Now, I have one last agenda item here, which you're going to have to help me with, Twin. Online festival for a clean and pure internet. Sounds like a party or something. What, what, what's the online festival? Come on up here and talk to folks about this. <coughs> uh, yesterday at uh, MIT, we uh, announced already with the uh, support from Mark Cavan Institute for Brain Science Research. And uh, that is uh, 2 p.m. Boston time, but 4 p.m. in, uh, 4 a.m. December 12 in, Dece in um, Tokyo time. That means uh, Global Cyber Security Day already at that time. So today now we continue Global Cyber Security Day at 12 uh, p.m. now. And uh, exciting, that is, uh, this is the time Boston Global Forum was uh, born. 12 p.m. December 12. And we have uh, for clean and pure internet, that is a festival online to um, encourage people uh, post picture, videos, stories to support for a clean and pure internet and support for ethical code of conduct for cyber peace and security. Uh, uh, one initiative of uh, Boston Global Forum. Today, we introduce uh, Mario Marcillo. He from Mozambique. He's a photographer. He is one of top 100 uh, global thinkers named by foreign policy recently, some days ago. So Mario can talk something to support for that. <coughs> One, one last comment, and we'll wrap things up. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Mario, and um, yeah, I was in, I was invited for this event, which I find uh, very interesting for me. And as I said before, so I am a documentary photographer, and uh, my work is more concerning to uh, human rights and um, human rights, uh, children rights, and the. Uh, uh, and a woman. So um, what I'm trying to do also with my work is that um, I, I believe in the power of still image to, 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 to bring uh, positive change related to the world we are living in. And what I do in Mozambique, as I, as I explained before, uh, more about education and how the um, majority of uh, uh, local population, they don't have a really formal education. And when we talk about the internet, when we're talking about information, uh, they, are out of, they are out of the world we are living in. And, um, and uh, with my work, so I, I, try, to, I try to contribute uh, for a better world. And, uh, and uh, I think that um, uh, it's very, I mean, it's very important uh, for me, uh, um, um, it's very important for me like, to do what I do because I believe in it. And uh, the reason it's important is because um, I try, I try to uh, develop projects that involve the local population so they can know uh, what we're talking about and which world we are living in. And at the same time, with this project that I've been doing, I've been bringing them uh, to different places where another people also can see these realities. And, um, and uh, I think that uh, it's, it's a very important uh, uh, event <laughs> about the poor internet because um, it's more constructive in in an uh, educational way. So uh, thank you so Great. much. Thank you for joining us. Just a few thank yous before we wrap up. First to Twan, who of course, without whom we wouldn't be here, and he and his staff have done just uh, extraordinary work to bring us together and to get the Global Forum moving. And I hope this is the beginning of even more. Um, to our friends at uh, UCLA for their contribution, and particularly the UNESCO UCLA Chair on Global Citizenship Education for incorporating now the Code of Conduct and Global Cybersecurity Day in their educational program. As some of you know, difficult though it is, Kitty and I drag ourselves off to UCLA the day after Christmas, and we don't come back until the 1st of April. It's a terrible burden. Somebody's got to do it, do it. So we'll be out there, but we'll be very much a part of this. And, um, and secondly, Bob, to you and the folks at the McGovern Institute for contributing so much to, um, to what we've done here, and especially this day, uh, a thank you to you all. <clears throat> and I hope and expect that uh, we're going to take this now and really move it, and with your help and support, 
see if we can't make this something that the world pays attention to. It's awfully important.